Good morning and welcome to Shattering Mist, the program that is devoted to those of you who have come to the realization that all human institutions are corrupt, whether they be religious, political, military, or economic, and that there is no salvaging them. They're rotten to the core. They're actually against the interests of the people that they claim to be protecting. If you're open to that realization or have come to that conclusion, join us. If you would like to defend a political or religious institution or a military one, have at it. You're welcome to uh, try to challenge what we have to say. Our number, if you'd like to join us either way, toll free, 877 300 7645. We have Kirk with us, and as our custom on Friday, since we have IQ Al Rasuli in the second hour, we're going to begin by talking about to those things that are actually trustworthy, productive, beneficial. Hey, Kirk, you're um, a bit of a historian, correct? Oh, well, I read a lot. Okay. Um, what is the most well read, most popular, um, most copied historical? Um, well, we'll just, let's say that uh, by historical, that's probably, uh, I'm not saying that it's a, it's, a, it's a portrait of history. Let's call it um, the most popular text written uh, prior to um, the conversion from uh, BCE to CE. What is the most popular story, the most popular text uh, in ancient history? Well, that, you know, I doubt it would be the Torah because so few no. people read it, so it has to be no. the Greek, uh, what's the, uh, oh, Homer wrote it. Homer, yep. yeah. Yep. Uh, the Iliad Odyssey. and the uh, Odyssey. Uh, and right, Iliad. right, yeah. The Odyssey is vastly more popular than the Iliad, but uh, correct, it is the uh, the Odyssey, and, and even close. Now, in terms of just uh, ancient manuscripts available to us today prior to, to uh, the transition from BCE to CE, it really is the Torah. There are more copies of the Torah uh, and prophets and psalms than there is anything else in terms of surviving text because they were so well protected and because particularly of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But overall, throughout the world, the most popular text of all time is the Odyssey. Is the Odyssey a true story? No. Okay. What if I were to tell you that I really believe the Odyssey? Uh, so you're welcome to believe your, to your belief, but uh, you'd be disappointed. No matter how, what if I were to able to convince uh, 51 percent of the world to believe that the Odyssey is a true story? Well, they say 40 million Frenchmen can't be wrong, but they can. <laughs> so you're telling me that the uh, the Odyssey, even though it's enormously popular, the most popular text in uh, the ancient world. That, uh, and it claims that Odysseus, um, he's known as Ulysses in, uh, in uh -huh. Roman mythology, but Ulysses, uh, Odysseus in the, uh, in the original Greek text, um, was uh, not engaged in a discussion uh, with Athena uh, and Zeus about his fate. Uh -huh. That's, uh, you know, so they, they so he could talk to the just, gods. Just, just because he was, you know, he claims he was talking to the gods. So. Does, doesn't that mean that there's a case to be made for a, um, a, a goddess named Athena and a god named Zeus? Well, according to the Greeks. How about uh, they were talking about Odysseus's enemy, the uh, the god of the sea, Poseidon. Mm -hmm. And they were, um, um, everybody was uh, absent at uh, this moment from Mount Olympus. So why is it that it's not credible it's not wise, it's not informed or rational to believe the Odyssey when it speaks of these gods and goddesses and is so enormously popular. Well, we, you know, in our culture, we believe it is a, a, a fable, but uh, I'm sure somebody may have thought it and thought it serious at times. But, you know, the whole story is about the miraculous things that happen and in interactions with uh, gods and goddesses along the, uh, the way. Um, but you can't prove them. Well, actually, you can prove they didn't exist. Well, that's what I mean. But you can't prove that these things, these events uh, happened, mm -mm. like prophecy and uh, and the Torah. You but, it, but it comes from a book that isn't nearly as popular, that is historically accurate, mm -hmm. the Iliad. Right. So the fact that it's, uh, it's written by um, the same fella, 
uh, and is based upon a historical book that is uh, historically accurate, the Iliad. Why shouldn't we, by association, believe this this uh, new testament isn't uh, accurate? Why? Why wouldn't it be accurate if it's based on the the Old Testament of the Iliad and it's historically truthful? Well, if it was based on it, then it would be exactly the same, wouldn't it? it well, have a little more information in it, but it the, would, would the characters, uh, it. yeah, the characters and their uh, and their interactions mm -hmm. would be uh, and would be the same. But in this case, the one of the characters emerges from the Iliad, only one, and that one character um, now engages with all manner of false gods. Mm -hmm. Sounds a lot like the Christian Old Testament, which is historically true, and having one character out of it all of a sudden be painted into a scene of mythology engaging with false gods. It sounds like the same thing to me. Oh, well, you know, that's, that's very good. But uh, if uh, if someone were to um, to uh, challenge you when you say, listen, it is absolutely impossible. There is a zero percent possibility, zero, that the Christian New Testament is the inerrant Word of God. Right. Now you'd have the vast majority of Christians have a conniption fit, and uh, and then when you say, but I believe it to be so, and you say, but it doesn't matter if three billion people believe it to be so. No. It's absolutely ignorant and irrational to believe that the Christian New Testament is the inerrant word of God. Yeah, well, even, even, uh, well, how do, you, how do you deal with the fact that the minute it was, uh, is the, the King James, for instance, is published, it comes out with, they come out with scholars in Cambridge that have immediately 30,000 uh, 30, errors. Well, yeah, there's 30,000 errors. Even between, even between, even between yeah. Uh, what there's, I mean, the first year of his first year of his publication, well, the guy over in Cambridge is uh, at the University of Oxford University, yeah, or over yeah. at Oxford at Cambridge, yeah. is doing this. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mills, what he found actually is there's thirty thousand known discrepancies mm -hmm. between twelfth century and manuscripts uh, and the Texas Receptus. Yeah. The number of errors between the twelfth century manuscripts and the King James mm -hmm. would would be ten times that amount. Oh, yeah, right. Matter of fact, what yeah. we have found now since we have unearthed so many first, second and third century, sixty nine of them as a matter of fact, first, second and third century, early fourth century manuscripts of uh the witness writings uh, as well as the poison pen of Paul that collectively we have found that there are over 300,000 changes over the uh, the years between those documents and the Nestle Allen, which now represents the basis of most English translations. If you've got 300,000 variants and 180,000 words, All right. one would be sufficient to tell you, well, it's not inerrant. Ten would be a concern. A hundred would be serious. A thousand would be a horrific problem. Ten thousand catastrophic. A hundred thousand overwhelming. Tear it up. Three hundred thousand known variants. Yeah. Among one hundred eighty thousand words disregarded. Yeah. yeah. But it's certainly not uh, not inerrant. But if they say, but you know, look how many people believe it to be so, just because you don't think it's so, you know, I'm not going to accept your position. It's the same as the as the Odyssey, isn't it? Absolutely sure. And they would say, well, you know, it was all the characters and every all the events were predicted in the Old Testament, giving it uh, credibility. It's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And they'd say, well, the same thing was true between the Iliad and the Odyssey. doesn't make the Odyssey true, does it? No. Odyssey was really popular, still didn't make it true. No. But the places, the, the places described in the, uh, in the Odyssey actually exist. Still doesn't make it true, does it? No. They actually got Odysseus's name right. Um, but they didn't get uh, Yosha's name right. Still doesn't make it true, does it? No. Well, that's the beauty of twisting, though. You have to have some truth. I mean, yeah. that tells much about the story if you can name some places and times and things going yeah. on. That it was popular because not only was it an entertaining story, but because there was a shred of truth into it. But if uh, you're an artist, if you were to draw a hundred dollar bill 
and get 99% of the strokes right on your depiction of a $100 bill. I can fool a lot of folks. Does that? You could fool a lot of folks, but uh, what would the value of that bill actually be? Well, it uh, wouldn't be worth anything. Yeah, it would actually get you in trouble, wouldn't it? Well, I was going to say, once I get caught, it's going to be... Yeah, they, it, has a negative, it has a negative value, which is the exact same thing as the Christian New Testament, because it has so many counterfeit strokes, it actually, rather than being worthless, it's counterproductive. We have uh, Glenn with us. Uh, what do you think, Glenn, about the comparison between the Iliad and the Odyssey? Well, in terms of Homer, it's not that unusual for one author to dabble in both fiction and nonfiction. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's right. a relatively yeah. common occurrence even today. Yeah, I know a guy that uh, has written uh, some 15 books, and uh, the uh, the second uh, book that he wrote was the only one that he wrote that was nonfiction. I'm assuming it was fiction. Right. It was fiction. All the rest were nonfiction. Well, in, in terms of uh, gods being fictional, the the um, Corinthians thought often to capitalize upon this in their line of argumentation. They'll say, well, well, yeah, we readily agree with you that um, all of these gods, these other gods are fictional. We just want to add one more god to the list, yours. Yeah. And they, they do that, that apologetically all the time. Correct. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you, if you want to be part of our religion, no problem. We want you to be part of it because then you'll, we'll have control over you. We'll be able to fleece you. We'll be able to influence you. You'll empower us. Our, uh, our power base grows. And if all we have to do is incorporate your god and, and uh, goddesses and your religious festivals and rites and doctrine into it, no problem. Makes us more popular. You mean the atheists as a religion, is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, it's, whether it's atheism or Christianity, that's how Christianity was formed. Church, yeah. Well, yeah. And atheism really has incorporated, I mean, hook, line, and sinker, the, uh, the ancient um, earth, wind, and fire, Mother Earth, uh, religious doctrines, I mean, the oldest of all pagan doctrines, which, uh, which in, in essence worshipped the earth and the things of the earth. And that is the, kind of the heart and soul of socialist, secular, environmentalism today. And they're don't inseparable. Be picking, don't be picking on Earth, Wind, and Fire. They had some great tunes. Yes, they did. But they weren't gods. Oh, no, well. No. And uh, that is the point. No matter how much secular humanists want you to believe that we belong to the Earth, it is not true. That was actually the single most common criticism that I received after having written and published Yada Ya and then uh, Questioning Paul was the Christian complaint was that they could not even fathom the idea that I could be right and that over a billion Christians and billions and billions of Christians over time could all be wrong the same argument of the Iliad versus the Odyssey, isn't it? And so what do you do under those circumstances? Uh, I mean, all you've got is evidence and reason. You can reveal to people the uh, horrible condition of the text, 300,000 known errors, differences between the oldest versions and the basis of modern translations. And that is before you get to the translation errors, which add hundreds of thousands more variances, that it isn't even remotely accurate. Now what? Now what? Now you've got contradictions in the uh, in the stories. You've got the most quoted story: uh, "Let uh, he who has no sin cast the first stone," uh, and forgiving the adulterous Roman and writing something in the uh, in the dirt and saying, you know, the, your accusers have gone, then, you know, I also forgive you. And yet it didn't occur. Now, every copy, thousands upon thousands prior to the 7th century, skip over that whole thing. Go from the end of the 7th chapter of Yahoo, Khan, and John, into the 13th verse of, uh, of the 8th chapter of Yahweh, Connor, and John. It was added 800 years later. It, it's just not credible. And then you've got half of it written by a man who is obviously lying, who acknowledges being demon-possessed, who tells us bluntly that he's insane. 
reveals that he is a murderer and that he's a sexual pervert in his letters. And throughout his letters, his primary premise is to contradict God. He claims he speaks for Yosha and yet never quotes him accurately, only attempts to quote him once, and that was out of context and errant, horribly errant. So what are you left with? This notion that God can't be trusted, so that he chose Paul to, uh, to come up with an entirely different plan that contradicts everything that he had previously promised? You know, a, Kirk, a similar story to this would be the, uh, the story that exists in the, uh, in the Quran, where the Quran claims that it's an Abrahamic religion and, and names uh, Abraham and Yishak and, uh, and, uh, and Ishmael, uh, even names Doe to David, uh, wrongly names Yosha, calls him Esau, which is the name for the one person God called out by name to say that he hates of the prophet. Yeah, and uh, and then it claims that it's the uh, inspired by the same God who uh, inspired the Torah, and yet twists and perverts the Torah's presentation and the prophet's presentation of these people's lives, such that it bears no resemblance to the actual person. So why would anybody in their right mind believe it's true? You know, the Christian pr presentation of Jesus bears absolutely no resemblance to the actual individual. No. Well, I, I used to say when I was a Christian, the other Christian, I'd say, you know, that uh, everywhere he went, he, he, he argues with and, and shows his dislike for religious people. So why do you want to be religious? Right. In fact, he even shows his disdain for crowds. Every time there was a crowd, what did he do? He walked away, walked away, tried to actually sneak away where, where no one would find him. And what he wanted to do is just spend quality time with the, uh, uh, with the 12 mm -hmm. fellows that he chose. Yeah, Doesn't that tell you a lot about, yeah, family. Doesn't that tell you a lot about God's interest? I, I don't want to be surrounded by a gazillion people with all sorts of, of selfish ideas and selfish interests with all sorts of corrupt ideas, I, I just want to go away with my friends. But isn't that profound that he would constantly walk away from the crowds to spend time with uh, talking with his disciples, teaching his disciples, those who were open to him, who really wanted to learn from him? It doesn't sound like a politician, does it? No, it doesn't sound like a, uh, a religious leader that would uh, draw millions of people in relish it. You know, it, no matter what way you look, he's the antithesis of how he is portrayed in religious circles. We'll be back in a moment. Why is it that 99.9999% of Muslims and Christians, both of whose religion claims that the Torah was inspired by their God, those who claim that they have been saved by their God, those who pray regularly to their God, don't trust their God when he issued an invitation for them to meet with him seven times a year, and they just don't show up. Why do they ignore each and every invitation to be called out and to meet with God? Why is that, Kirk? Well, the preachers tell them it's not important. And then they so, substitute something else to make it, uh, <clears throat> give them something else to do. Like, why would you, why would you trust the preacher over God? Well, I've learned to be. <laughs> <laughs> why would anyone do I've that? I've learned not to, but uh, it's, <clears throat> sometimes you just fall for the old, the old line. The Pope claims that he is representing God. Right. Uh, if he's representing God, why didn't he show up for Yom Kippur? Why didn't he answer the invitation for Sukkah? Why didn't he advise all Roman Catholics to do the same? Well, you have to conclude that he's his God that doesn't uh, require that. Then you ask, who, who is your God? 
Yeah. Who is your God? Because it's Yahweh that that says if you don't, I'm going to tell you, I'm inviting you, and it's a free will. You get to choose, but you need to know the consequence. It's like anything else that you have a free will over. If, if I have free will as to whether or not I'm going to um, uh, join the military and then uh, sacrifice myself on the battlefield uh, um, I'm trying to block machine gun fire because I, I really like the, uh, the guy that's, uh, that's standing behind me, uh, that's my free will. I made that choice, but there's a consequence, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They're going to send me home in a body bag. That's right. It did. Yeah, it did. So in the case of Yahweh's invitations, you can attend or ignore them or reject them. But if you reject them or ignore them, there is a consequence. Yeah. yeah your and, life is over. Right. You know, with um, with uh, Yom Kippurim, God said you're going to be outside the family, estranged from the family. There's only one family. That's the covenant. And uh, you're going to be cut off, banished, ceasing to exist, dead, gone, no more. Serious, serious stuff. Serious stuff. I mean, you know, he's saying, you know, it's not what I want for you. But, you know, if you're going to ignore my invitation to live with me, to be perfected by me, to be empowered by me, to be enriched by me, to be reconciled to me, if you're going to ignore those things, this is the consequence. So here we go. It's uh, these godly and specific appointed and designated meeting times, Moed. Now, if you see, you just came across the word Moed, mm -hmm. and you were following Yahweh's instructions and you were observant, wouldn't you want to look up Moed just to get a sense of, uh, of what the word means and, and how it was used in context? When was the first time that Yahweh used the word Moed in his uh, testimony to us? In Genesis. Yeah. In fact, uh, first chapter, right? Mm-hmm. He called, he called the fourth day. He said the fourth day was uh, uh, a sign of the greater light for the purpose of the Moed. Well, a sign, greater light, Moed. Isn't he talking about these meetings? Mm -hmm. This is a sign. In fact, if you want to get right down to it, the fourth day speaks of the fourth millennia of human history outside the Garden of Eden. It's the first four Moed were fulfilled in year 4,000 Yah, mm -hmm. which was 33 CE in our pagan calendars with Pesach, Matzah, Bakotam, and Shavuah. And these are the last three Moed, with Sukkah being the last uh, of them, seven of seven. And so Yahweh yeah, defines what Moed is. It's a meeting, appointed meeting, designated by the authority. So you think that God set up a meeting. You know, I was, I've, I've worked for people, and I've, uh, I've worked with people, and I've uh, owned my own businesses. Sure. When I worked for people, and the boss set up a meeting, Show up. I showed up 100% of the time. If uh, I called a meeting when I was the boss, those people who kept their jobs, they showed up 100% uh -huh. of the time. If, uh, if you're doing anything that's important, but somebody, particularly if you respect the individual that you're, you're associated with or you're benefiting in some way from that person, and they call a meeting, you show up. But this just happens to be God. You know, this whole gig is his. Mm hmm Well, think of the nature of the, of the meetings, though. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the first, yeah, the first meeting here is to uh, is for him to make the sacrifice personally required to make you immortal. I think I'd show up for that. I mean, that's like bonus day, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the ultimate bonus days. And the second, now, you don't need to show up, maybe, but I do because I'm really flawed. And so the second one is uh, now that I'm immortal, it would be really good to be perfected because to be immortal and imperfect would mean I'd be eternally separated from God. I, that doesn't sound like a fun time. That would be Sheol. No. So the second meeting makes a flawed guy like me perfect. And, and what do I have to do other than show up? 
Yeah, what, what exactly are you you uh, uh, doing to help this? Uh, I'm, uh, other than showing up. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm I'm uh, making sure that the bread that I eat does not have yeast, so that symbolically I understand that the fungus of yeast it represents religious and political rebellion against God. And that, but it's, you're not making a sacrifice. You, you're you're, you're, yeah, you're well, participating, but you know, you know, I, really, I really like yeast. Sacrifice. I really like yeast. Well, I am doing something that is depriving me of something that I enjoy. Yeah, I, I happen to, enjoy, you know, the, the, le the level of the sacrifice for one week of ridding my uh, my diet of yeast is uh, is de minimis compared to the gain. But I've I've at least done something. Okay. Now, okay. you know, I'm uh, I provide for my family and myself and barbecue lamb. Provide a fine bottle of red wine, and I provide uh, unyeasted bread, bitter herbs, dipping in, uh, in olive oil on Pesach. I'm making a contribution. Yeah. I'm showing up with something. Yeah, yeah, you brought something to the party. I brought something to the party. Now I'm going to eat what I brought. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's not much of a sacrifice. You're going to drink some of that wine, aren't you? Uh, I am. Oh. But, uh, but I've made a contribution uh, to the party. And so the first two, you'd think you'd show up. Now, the third one, uh, I'm, you know, you, you, I guess you would have to to know who you're being adopted uh, to. Um, you know, I've, I've been around a lot of really wonderful characters and a lot of uh, not-so-wonderful characters. There are some people I don't want to be associated with. And I have, particularly in business, man, I've run into people I don't want to be associated with. And I've met people historically. Like, if I were to be adopted by the uh, Obominator, I'm going to pass. Mm -hmm. You know, adoption is only good, as good as the individual you're, whose family you're being adopted into. You know, I'm going to pass. If Merkel said, you know, I'll adopt you into my family. i got, you know, a good gig here going to Germany. Okay. I'm, I'm going to pass. You know? Hitler was a pretty lonely guy. What if he had you know, said, I'll adopt you into my fan van? You know, he had lots of fun toys. You know, I'm going to pass. Mm. So, you know, the bottom line is adoption is a good thing if you like and you're comfortable with and you respect the person who's adopting you and if you want to spend a lot of time with them. But that's the third meeting is to be adopted. And the fourth meeting, boy, that's bonus time. Mm -hmm. You show up at the fourth meeting. And uh, as a beneficiary of the first third, you're now adopted into God's family, and, and it's all about, well, the bonus is enrichment and, uh, yeah, and enlightenment, empowerment. That works for me. And, you know, the fourth meeting, the fifth meeting, well, it's, um, you know, a lot of people would uh, think that since you, you're not given eternal life, you're not given perfection, uh, you're not uh, adopted into Yahweh's family, you're not enriched and empowered, that the fifth meeting is can't be as much fun. It's yet it's my favorite. Teruah. Because on Teruah, you're empowered to do what is the most fun. To use your knowledge. Yeah, to use your knowledge to share what uh, Yahweh has shared with us. Uh -huh. To encourage other people to consider what he has to uh, to offer. To warn people that just because your religion is popular, just because lots of people believe it, doesn't make that odyssey true. No. We have uh, Wayne on the line calling in from uh, the state of Texas, and uh, he's got a question on the time of the uh, Moeds. Hello, Wayne. Hello, Wayne. You're, uh, you're on. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was curious about this timing of the Moeds. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, like you were saying, uh, boss calls a meeting. You show up. Correct. You have to show up on his time. Correct. So where in Scripture do I find the instructions to formulate this lunar calendar? Oh, it's really simple. I mean, uh, you know, it uses the, uh, the term kadash which is the Hebrew word for month and moon and uh, the verbal root to renew to describe the, uh, the basis of his, uh, of his timing. And throughout Leviticus as he's presenting, which would be kata, as he's presenting these seven meetings, he tells you specifically that they are uh, based upon the first and the seventh renewal of the, uh, of the light on the moon surface. So, that's uh, that's pretty straightforward. Second, well, no, it, 
It doesn't really say that, though. If you look That's at Genesis it, 1 Yes, 15, it does. Yes, it does. No, I mean, I mean no, you can... Is. No, well, then you're not asking a question. You're called to make a, uh, a statement, but uh, it, they all do. And, uh, for example, this one. Uh, let's just shut this down because we had a person that wanted to make a their own uh, statement. But here, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe for the purpose of saying, converse with the children of Israel on the 15th day of the seventh month. What is the basis of month? Kirk, are you familiar with that word, month? Uh, Wayne here doesn't seem to know it. What is the what is the basis of the word month? 15th day of the month is um, uh, Kodesh. Kodesh, yes. And Kodesh is based upon what Hebrew verb? Um, um, Kadosh. Kadosh. Oh, Kadosh, okay. Yeah, and Kadosh means renewal, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Renewal of the moon, yeah. Yeah. So in Hebrew, the word for month is based upon the Hebrew word for renewal. And so all you've got to do is consider the meaning of the word, and you know that this is the seventh renewal of the light on the moon's surface. Now, how would we then go about determining the first month of the year? So, I mean, this, the seventh is pretty straightforward. The seventh time that uh, light is renewed on the moon's surface. But so let's help Wayne out here. Wayne doesn't think that it, uh, that it says this kind of stuff. Yeah. Does Yahweh explain what was prevalent during the, um, the first month, during the Exodus? Does he give you any indication about the environment, what, what you would see at the time of the first month? Well, it's the barley. Oh, yeah, he calls it a beep, doesn't it? Yeah, he calls it a beep, which means that the barley ear is uh, is green and still growing, uh, and barley is the first grain mm -hmm. to um, to sprout a kernel in the the spring. When does when does that occur for the most part around the world? <clears throat> well, March, April. Yeah, uh, right around the uh, the equinox is when that occurs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then does he also tell us about the uh, the spring blooming of a of a plant that happened to be the flax? Mm -hmm. So right there in Exodus, as you're transitioning out of Exodus, names Shemot, into Para Leviticus, he's telling you that the timing of the first Passover was a beeb. When the barley is uh, is uh, grain is green and growing, there's a reason that he chose that time, by the way, and also when the flax has that blue flower. The blue flower is synonymous with uh, with uh, not only royalty but with with the heavens, and the uh, the flax uh, is the, the, the purity of the flax speaks of a white garment that is uh, woven from uh, something that is alive and living. And the the abib, the kernel of barley, barley is always the reference to a saved soul. Yeah. And it's green and growing, which means it's receptive, growing, living. Yes. Yeah. Right? So God's very specific about the time, and then he tells you on that first month, which is abib, count 14 days. Mm -hmm. So how is this difficult? What, what part of well, it's, this it's is... Easier, I grant it's easier for farmers and people who are agricultural because they, they live with this every day than us city dwellers, but uh, you can certainly... Uh, it's not that hard if you look at the words real close. I mean, you, you know, say, oh, okay, okay. You know, the... Uh, well, I don't give rabbis much credit for many things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they figured out is that, that um, you don't have to be a farmer to figure this out. You know, the timing of, uh, of barley... Uh, is consistently right around the uh, the equinox, and all you have to do is take the first renewal of the moon's light closest to the equinox, and you and that's all you need to do. Yeah. Now, is there the possibility that one year out of every ten or so that there may be two renewals of the moon's light, uh, very close, equally close, you know, two weeks away? 14, yeah. both, both of them, okay. you know, one, one 14 days away, one 15 days yeah. away, because the moon phase yeah. is 29 and a half days. Is there the possibility that every 10 to 20 years or so that you might um, pick the uh, the wrong renewal of the moon's light? Well, I, I think Curry sent your email asking about, like, 2016. Yes. And yeah, 2016 is one of those. Yeah, 2016 is one of those where you've got a um, well, one that's 14 days, one that's 15 days away. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, it's possible that you could uh, we could goof and get that one wrong. Mm -hmm. um, is it uh, possible 
that because Yahweh doesn't give definite instructions on the conditions uh, uh, required for this kadash, the renewal of the moon's light, is it possible that you and I could come up with a different night to celebrate Pesach or uh, Armata? Sure. We could be off a day or two. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could be. Yeah. In fact, there was a lot of people that celebrated Teruah, uh, uh, as well as Kippurim and Sukkah, a day earlier than uh, well, I did. I'm a, I'm a day earlier on Sukkah than you were. I was doing right. the afternoon, right. just because I right. have it in my book. And it is. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so here's the, uh, yeah, yeah, here's the difference. Yeah, Yawin doesn't, all he tells us is Kadosh, which means renewal. So it has to be at a time when the moon's light is uh, renewing on the sun. The, uh, the, the reflected light on the moon is renewing. But there are a lot of things that go into uh, to that calculus. For example, in our world uh, to, today, uh, the day lasts until midnight. But the day in, uh, uh, in the Hebrew began at sundown and ended at sundown. So because of that instruction, if light begins to renew on the moon's surface, but only after sunset. You know, if the sun has already gone down before the renewal occurs, even though technically that's the astronomical count in today's uh, parlance, I won't count it because it's inconsistent with the day from a, a Hebrew a Torah perspective. So uh, I'm, I only will count an astronomical uh, two then to observe physically if the light is uh, renews on the moon's surface before the sun has set. Now, is there a specific instruction on that? Nope. But can you make the connection between things and say, yeah, that seems like that's reasonable? That's fair. Yeah. That's, uh, that's fair. Um, so you can be off by a, um, a day and, and the the realization that you can be off by a day, I think, is by design. Yeah. Because well, you're well, not going you can't make a religion out of it. You know, you can't yeah, you can't right. be someone that says, well, I know for certain, and I can take you know this this or that the reason, and I can state it for certain, while uh, while uh, you know uh, those who I think are really open minded and rational about the evidence will say. You know, I'm not going to go to the mat and say I'm absolutely certain. I'll say, here's the evidence, here's the thinking. You know, you decide. Think it through. Yeah. Well, the worst case scenario, you can celebrate two days in a row, you know. <laughs> yes, you can. In fact, you know, it doesn't mind that. Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Example is to, uh, is to go on with it. Glenn, you've called back. Uh, yeah, yeah, I heard that caller. Um, I kind of wish you had... Um, Give him a little more of a chance to voice his objection because I think you could have probably refuted and corrected him fairly easily. Like as it stands, it makes it least look. You know, he's saying, yes, he's afraid of me." You know, you, you know, yeah. he didn't even let me get my. Um, you know, he started to quote something from Genesis, and you know, we're talking about the way the things are laid out in Leviticus. I think it would, you know, it would be relatively easy to. Um, yeah, let know, me tell you why. I, why point with him. Right. Let me tell you why I shut him down. I shut him down because. Uh, twice he says, no, that's not what it says. And, uh, and right. so he is at that point making a statement that is untrue. Well, that's yeah. not what it says. That is what it says. And so I went right back to the, the first introduction here of, uh, of Asuka. And Asuka, that's exactly what it says. So, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to allow somebody to say, no, that's not what God says, when that's, in fact, exactly what, God, right. what God says. Now, right. if he wanted to make a point from, uh, from Genesis, then if he had taken the approach of, uh, okay, granted, I understand that's what it says there, but, but it, that seems to be contradicted by, or is, there's, a, there's an interesting angle that you may want to consider in Genesis, I would have let him make his Genesis yeah, presentation. Yeah, probably, yeah, just as, as a novice and as, as someone who doesn't really know much about this yet, um, I, I want to make a point about how people learn things. Um, okay. Because you're saying it's not like it's simple. And actually, like, I think of the, the various things, you know, 
that you learn. Like, okay, so this, uh, I, first of all, I have to think calendrical study is actually you know, something somewhat inherently complex and, and that sort of thing. Most, most people don't even know what a lunar calendar is. Oh, by the way, I, I agree with you. I think, I think this is complicated. I don't think it's simple. Right. I think that, uh, I, I think if you take your time and work yourself through it, if you are observant right. and open-minded and uh, informed and rational, that, that yeah. ultimately you don't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed to get it, but I would never claim it's, it's simple. I think it's, I think it's fairly easy, but only easy if you dedicate the time to it. Well, yeah, but then you also, it's a matter of, and it's also repetition and learning. For example, when you're learning mm -hmm. to play the piano, you play scales. If I'm learning the months of the year of the child, yeah. I'm going January. If, every month, if I'm learning a phonetic alpha, that I'm going to alpha, bravo, charlie, delta, fox, you know, mm -hmm. repeat these things. If I'm learning the trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, curious, you know, you get to work these things and repeat them. Oh, great. And, and um, I don't even know all the names, like, I'm not sat down to do my calendrical stuff for the Hebrew but, uh, you know, I, I can't rattle off you know, the months in Hebrew, I can unravel up to bed, I'll say, 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 you have to have the resources in front of you. You have to read them, then you have to repeat yeah. well, them. Well, 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 actually, you know what's interesting about the months in Hebrew is the same thing with the days in Hebrew. The days of the week in Hebrew are just numbers. Numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's pretty easy in the days of the week. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, Shabbat is just seven. Uh, in terms of the month of the years, the first month has a uh, uh, has a name, but after that, they're just numbers. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and sometimes thirteen. Pardon? I'm not as good. What I have not but, 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 uh, uh, Other than knowing the Hebrew word for seven and probably for one, each odd, uh, you don't need to know that.